Hi everyone and welcome to History Science Fiber. My name is Zoe McDonald. I'm a biologist and today we're so excited because we've been waiting to do this video to show you just what this fungus looks like when it's fresh and packed with dye. So today we are covering one of the cornerstones of the mushroom dye world. A prince among polypores, the queen of the conchs, known simply as Dyer's polypore. Today we are diving into Feola schweinitzii. Let's get started. Now, this video is part of two playlists, one on dyeing with mushrooms and the other on dyeing from autumn foraging. So if you like this video, feel free to like and subscribe for more natural dye videos. So there are five basic reasons that make this such a great dyer. Number one, really stable pigments. Number two, they give deep, bright colors. Number three, it's highly concentrated dyer. And number four, it's fairly common in many regions around the world. And five, it can grow quite large, big, heavy terraces, which makes it easy to dye with without doing a lot of extra foraging work. This polypore is saprophytic, meaning it's parasitizing the conifer trees it's living on, causing a condition called butt rot. <laughs> West of the Rockies, it can usually be found on or adjacent to Western Hemlock in October and November, though it can also be found on Western Red Cedar, Fir, Pine, and Larch. East of the Rockies, it's more often observed on or near Spruce and other conifers. If you're looking to zero in on the type of tree in your area it might be found on, that could be a great reason to search out your local mushroom group and get more information. Now in terms of colors, you can get everything from a yellow to a rich gold to deep browns to dark olive greens and all the shades in between. So what does a dyer's polypore look like? Well, the fruiting body can be found on the ground near the base of trees growing up from the roots or else on the tree itself. It grows so quickly that you can see grass and twigs sometimes incorporated into its structure. It generally has a dark brown center becoming more pale towards the edge. The edge itself can be a pale orange, yellow, even a white, and can grow in circular terraces up to 25 centimeters or 10 inches in diameter. Underneath, it may have a yellow or pale cast, but over time it darkens and loses its high dye concentration. I also found when I'm chopping it up, it has a distinct stew-like smell, though it is inedible. So here we are back in the woods um, and I wanted to show you what year old Dyer's polypore looks like. And if you can have a look, that, re that rim has lost that pale yellow, pale white color. Um, and also you can see underneath, you, you can kind of, if you feel it, it's very crumbly like old coffee ground. So it's really past its prime. It'll have a little bit of dye potential, but not nearly what it is when it's fresh. I started off with three hanks of pure wool, two of which were mordanted previously with alum and one with iron. Now, mordanting is often a key part of the natural dye process, and there are separate videos on exactly how to do that. For these, the alum was 16% weight of fiber and the iron was 6% weight of fiber, both heated previously for an hour and allowed to cool. Weight of fiber just means the weight of the mordant compared with the weight of the dry fiber. I started off by weighing all three hanks together for a total of 35 grams or just over one ounce. Then I wanted to pre-soak the fiber in water, which will allow the fiber to sink into the dye pot and take up the color evenly. I usually soak the wool mordanted with alum separately than the fiber mordanted with iron, just to cut down on any cross-contamination, which can give me uneven dye results by darkening parts of the alum mordanted wool. From there, I weighed out the mushrooms. I had previously cut up and dried some dyer's polypore in a dehydrator. As this is a concentrated dyer, I used about half the weight of dried mushrooms to fiber. So the wool is 35 grams. I weighed out about 16, 17 grams or half an ounce and placed it into a large two liter or half gallon jar. The jar was then placed into a pot and water 
water was added to both the jar and the pot to set up a simple double boiler approach. If you're dyeing a lot of fiber at once, you can always scale up and just dye straight into the pot. In addition to the mushrooms, I added about one tablespoon of white vinegar, which helps make the yellow a more vibrant gold. The dyer's polypore is now heated to a simmer for one hour, careful not to let it boil. When I'm dying, I use these cheap reusable paint bags from the paint store. This is the one gallon size. It just makes it easier at the end to keep the mushrooms and the fiber separated. I had forgotten <laughs> to add it in the first place. So I just grabbed a new jar, added the bag and decanted the first jar into it. After simmering for an hour, I allowed it to cool. I then removed the bag and the dye pot is ready for the fiber. I added in all three premordanted hanks into the dye vat. The dye vat is then reheated to a simmer. After only about five minutes, the dye was already doing a great job and I decided to pull out the iron mordanton yarn and let it cool down as it was such a great olive green color. I find leaving in the iron mordanton for the whole hour can result in such a dark olive green. It can almost look like a really dark brown. I then left the two Allen Bordenton wool hanks in for the full hour to simmer. After the hour was done and the yarn was cool, I pulled one out and washed it. The other one I wanted to do a little experiment. First I took a new jar, added some hot water and dissolved about one teaspoon of ferrous sulfate, which is the iron mordant. I then took out the last remaining alum mordanted hank, wound it back up tightly and added it into the iron bath as a post dye dip, also known as a modifier. I was hoping the parts of the skeins that were exposed would have gone darker creating a variegated effect, but after about five minutes, it really didn't show much change. I ended up pulling it out and then rinsing it off. It came out a slightly darker yellow.
In the end, I got a bright gold, a deep gold, and a deep olive green. This fungi can give a wide range of colors and really deserves some time and experimentation to see what it can really do. Dyer's Polypore remains one of my favorite and most reliable dye mushrooms. Give it a try.